Good morning. Welcome to the Federalist Society's ambitiously titled first annual Executive Branch Review Conference. This conference is being held as part of the Federalist Society Practice Group's new Executive Branch Review Project. Now, over the past several years, many people around the country have noticed an increase in federal executive branch activity, whether through executive order or formal or informal administrative agency action. Our goal in launching the Executive Branch Review Project is to prompt a national debate about whether there truly has been an uptick in executive branch activity, and if so, with what consequence. To serve this goal, in April, the practice groups launched a new blog, executivebranchproject.com, that's all one word, executivebranchproject.com, and there's a card on your seat uh, that will direct you to that uh, blog site. Um, there's a QR code, which I understand if you take this card back to your children, uh, <laughs> they can use your cell phone and get you right to the blog. So. Uh, we've launched a blog in conjunction with this project. We'll begin a new quarterly publication quite soon. And uh, we have conducted and will continue to conduct programming throughout the year to highlight and discuss these activities, including standalone and in-person programs and our Teleforum conference calls, which have become very successful. And the Teleforum conference calls are discussed on the back side of this card with another QR code that your children can help you with. Uh, and of course today, the fourth prong of our executive branch project. Uh, we are here with some of the best and brightest minds in the country to debate and discuss this important topic at our first annual conference. It's my pleasure to introduce our first panel, which will address the core question of whether the administrative st state is, in fact, on the rise, possibly with some new ways of examining the question and even some suggested responses. Our first panelist, David McIntosh, is co-founder of the Federalist Society and a partner at Mayor Brown here in Washington, D.C., where his practice focuses on government affairs. He has plentiful experience in dealing with the administrative state, not only in private practice, but from the perspective of two branches of government. During the Reagan administration, he served as special assistant to the president for domestic affairs. During the first Bush administration, he served as executive director of Vice President Quayle's Council for Competitiveness. And then from 1995 to 2001, he served in the United States House of Representatives where he became chairman of the aptly named House Subcommittee on Regulatory Relief. Our second panelist, Jonathan Turley, is the J.B. and Maurice C. Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law at George Washington University Law School where he serves as the director of the law school's Environmental Law Advocacy Center and executive director of its project for older prisoners. Professor Turley is a nationally recognized expert legal scholar who has written extensively in areas ranging from constitutional law to legal theory to tort law. He's also a Federalist Society regular and we're very pleased to welcome him back today. Our third panelist, Senator Ted Cruz, was elected as just the 34th Senator from Texas in 2012. He served as a law clerk to Chief Justice William Rehnquist on the US Supreme Court. He spent five years in private practice as a partner at one of the nation's largest firms where he led the firm's US Supreme Court and national appellate practice. He received national acclaim as Solicitor General of Texas, achieving there a number of landmark victories. Now, as a United States Senator, he sits on a variety of committees, including the Senate Judiciary Committee. And to my mind, he always has interesting things to say about how the government functions and how it should function. We'll hear opening remarks from each, then a little discussion, and then questions from the audience. And with that, Congressman McIntosh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean. Um, thank you, Dean and Jean, for launching this program. Um, really, the decision to go forward with it was inspired by President Obama in his State of the Union address, where he said, if Congress won't pass legislation, then I'll do it as the executive. And so the question is, what's happening? Um, I want to step back and, and note that some one of those moments of irony that only happens in Washington when a few weeks ago we saw Lois Lerner testify before Capitol Hill and or rather we didn't get to see her testify as she pled the Fifth Amendment um, right and protection against self-incrimination 
the irony was that they were there to ask her about whether the IRS had abused conservative groups' rights to the freedom of assembly and to petition their government. Now when the IRS, or for that matter, any federal agency comes knocking, they are for the most part, practically speaking, unrestrained by the Bill of Rights. Basic principles of fairness that we guarantee even hardened criminals do not apply to many regulatory enforcement activities. As the regulatory state has exploded in the last century, checks and balances have been dislodged from agency protocol. Scholars have pointed out that agencies not only write the rules, they also serve as prosecutor, judge, and jury. Um, consider, for example, an uh, article that good, our good friend and Federalist Society board member Gary Lawson wrote in the Harvard Law Review, and I found this uh, so good, I have, I'm gonna quote or at least paraphrase from it. Um, it's a, a review of how a Federal Trade Commission proceeding would work. Um, the commission promulgates substantive rules of conduct. The commission then considers whether to authorize investigations into whether the commission's rules have been violated. If the commission authorizes an investigation, the investigation is conducted by the commission, which reports its findings back to itself. If the commission thinks that its own findings warrant an enforcement action, then the commission issues a complaint. The commission's complaint that its own rules have been violated is then prosecuted by the commission and adjudicated by the commission. This adjudication can either take place before the full commission or before a semi-autonomous commission administrative law judge. If the commission chooses to adjudicate before that administrative law judge rather than before itself, and the decision is adverse to the commission, the commission can then appeal to itself. If the commission ultimately finds a violation, then and only then the affected private party can appeal to an Article III court. But the agency decision, even before that bona fide Article III tribunal, possesses a very strong presumption of correctness on both matters of fact and law. Now over the past 100 years, all three branches, the executive, Congress, and the courts, have failed to apply key constitutional principles while erecting the modern administrative state. Other participants today will discuss the lack of separation of powers and the inherent problems that agencies present for the theory of enumerated powers. You can imagine um, what, is, what happens when an agency is issuing rules that are in the public interest and nothing more. But today I want to focus on how the regulatory enforcement has allowed the federal government to escape effectively from the Bill of Rights basic procedural protections that guarantee, or at least are erected as a barrier to arbitrary use of government power. It's difficult to overestimate the scale of the regulatory state and the impact that this system has on American citizens. Uh, the Small Business Association estimated that the total cost of regulations is approximately $1.75 trillion per year. George Will put that in perspective last week, writing that it's now more than half the size of the federal budget. It costs every U.S. household approximately $15,000 a year, or about a fourth of the average U.S. income. Americans pay more to comply with federal regulations than the total combined sum of both the corporate income tax and the individual income tax. Then you add on top of that the $61 billion on budget spending by the agencies to administer these regulations. It adds up to a massive expansion over the last 100 years, but more disturbing is the administrative, as the costs have grown, the procedural protections afforded Americans have not kept pace. Basic legal safeguards that we take for granted are not available when one faces a regulatory agency. Why? because many protections only apply to the final agency order or adjudication, which by some estimates is less than 10% of the total agency activity. Most of these steps, as that Gary Lawson pointed out in the Law Review article, are not final agency actions. Therefore, the citizen singled out by the commission for an inquiry and possible punishment has very little protection against arbitrary action. Those safeguards, trace themselves back to principles that our nation were fun founded on. They're fundamental to our system of justice, 
and yet they're woefully unavailable to Americans in many instances where they engage with their government. Some questions that I would urge the Federalist Society to look into are what constitutes due process in an agency action. At the heart of procedural protections is the guarantee that citizens should be able to get their day in court to review the legality of an agency action, thus avoiding enormous legal fees and fines before the decision is final. Take, for example, the case Sackett versus EPA, where the petitioner and his wife were told by EPA that their land is a wetland. They claimed it was not. All they wanted to do was have an ability for a court to tell them whether EPA was correct in asserting jurisdiction. EPA refused, and they sat and waited and could not build their house. As Justice Scalia points out, there needs to be some due process to avoid the shoot first, ask questions later approach to regulatory agency action. The right to counsel. When should an individual facing agency action be able to ensure they have legal representation at every meeting with the government? Miranda rights. Should agencies be required to advise citizens of their rights? at the outset of any action, similar to the Miranda rights that law enforcement agencies give uh, suspected criminals. Currently, agencies must provide notice, but very little else. Self-incrimination. Um, should individuals be able to assert that same Fifth Amendment that Lois Lerner did when she came to testify before Congress? Currently, the right holds very little weight against agency civil action. Right to a jury trial. Should the Seventh Amendment apply to regulatory adjudications? Perhaps most disturbing in light of recent events is that the IRS has some of the most citizen-friendly procedural protections. When I was in Congress, we passed something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which I was proud to support. It affords extra protections to targets of IRS audits. The right to representation, the ability to record your proceedings, although you have to give the IRS 10 days notice before you assert that right. The agencies have to provide you with your own bill of rights as a taxpayer. Yet these are woefully inadequate if anybody has encountered an IRS audit. And none of them apply to EPA or OSHA or other enforcement actions taken by federal agencies. Without these protections, citizens are left vulnerable to an agency that asserts its jurisdiction when it shouldn't have it, to take action that goes beyond the law. It's time for all three branches to step back from the accretive development of the regulatory state and take a fresh look at how we can apply Bill of Rights principles to modern government. My challenge to the Federalist Society in this project is very simple. Let's examine the ways in which the regulatory state has encroached upon these principles and consider bipartisan solutions to ensure that Americans have basic rights when facing an administrative agency. The approach should strive for a balance that the Founding Fathers achieved in drafting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We look to the federal government to provide ordered liberty. Today, that includes health, safety, the environment, free commerce, security against terrorists but we cannot sacrifice individual freedom. Just as we are willing to give the worst in our society basic judicial rights, we must insist that the modern administrative state be constrained by these same principles. Thank you for including me. I wish you a great day in the conference. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jonathan Turley. I want to, uh, it's always hard to follow David uh, without looking uh, the lesser for it, uh, but I'll do my very best. It's a great pleasure to be back at the uh, Federalist Society, particularly here at the inauguration of such an important new project. I want to congratulate my friend Dean Reuter and the entire so Federal Society for launching what I think is going to be uh, a really positive addition as we look at uh, the separation of powers, the roles of the different branches. Uh, this has been a particularly interesting project for me to see pop up because I've been writing a lot on the separation of powers. It's one of my focuses, but I have three law review articles coming out looking at different aspects of the administrative state. I, I have an affection for the Federal Society because I'm a Madisonian scholar. 
uh, as opposed to those uh, Jeffersonian scholars that uh, don't deserve much mention. Um, <laughs> the, I, I want to talk a little bit about the administrative state and how it's challenging notions uh, that we have in the Madisonian uh, system. And yes, it is a Madisonian system, uh, not a Jeffersonian one. Uh, the, the brilliance of the Madisonian system uh, is that it was a system that was held together by countervailing forces, making it uh, somewhat unique. It's not, some people have said that you know, we invented the uh, separation of powers, which is, which is incredibly wrong and insulting, uh, particularly Montesquieu and others, but uh, he's not objecting. But uh, we, do, we did create something unique in how we blended uh, these branches. I, one of my articles that's coming out actually looks at the influence of uh, Newtonian physics on people like uh, Madison. They were fascinated by Newtonian physics and Newtonian principles that had just uh, emerged in a significant way in the United States uh, scholarship. And they, they try to arrange this, these three orbs, these three branches in a way that they would be essentially captured in orbit, that they would essentially hold each other in orbit. It was a very ambitious program. And as many of you know, uh, really the touchstone of the philosophy that goes into our separation system was captured in the Federalist Society Papers number 51, uh, perhaps Madison's most famous writing. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three aspects of Federal Society 51, but I want to start with the uh, most obvious, uh, which is the line that is oft repeated, uh, that Madison warned that any system of government, uh, we have to guarantee that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And this was what is particularly um, rare in Madison. Montesquieu had this too, where he, people often misunderstand some of the writings of the framers. Madison really didn't have a particularly positive view of human beings. Um, it's not that he hated human beings. He tended to be, I wouldn't call him cynical, he was more realistic. He tended to see humans for their flaws. And he believed it was dangerous for a system uh, to assume the best motivations in people. That if you wanted a system that would last, you had to have a system that was reflective and prepared for those things that divide us, whether they're factions or not. And so what came out of the system was a, this tripartite system, a three-branch system, which is done exceptionally well. Um, what I've been writing about lately is the rise of what I call the fourth branch. It's not unique to me. This is a term that's been used uh, before to refer to the administrative uh, state. But what's surprising about the transformation of our federal system is the degree in which administrative uh, agencies have become insular and independent uh, and how that challenges the preconceptions of our tripartite system. Essentially, we're moving from a tripartite system, a three-branch system, to a quadripartite system or a four-branch system. It wasn't designed for four branches. And the result is that we're seeing a lot of dysfunctional impacts, particularly on Congress, as the center of gravity has moved in the Madisonian system. And in my view, it's a dangerous uh, transition. What's fascinating is that we often talk about federalism, how the federal government has come to dominate the states. But the domination of the federal government itself by uh, federal agencies represents a far greater threat to liberty. Uh, because it takes the system offline that was designed to guarantee liberty. Uh, what, 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 what I often uh, object to when folks talk about separation of powers, and they refer to it as basically a system of good government, uh, that's wrong. I mean, the, the, the separation of powers was designed to protect liberty. I mean, th that was the whole idea is that you would divide up power, you'd have checks and balances, but the purpose there was to protect liberty. That is, the framers believed that government was a threat to liberty, and they divided it to try to restrain government uh, in a meaningful way. Now, the recent uh, scandals involving the Justice Department, the IRS, the State Department, uh, really has given us sort of an insight into that. And uh, the fascinating thing is when you see all of these people that testified in Congress saying, I don't know. You know, Holder became a, almost a rap mantra uh, when he said, you know, I don't know, I know nothing, I had no involvement, I don't know, and he went over and over again in, in stating this. Now, obviously, some of that 
was opportunistic. Uh, some of it was willful blindness. But some of it might not be. I mean, the, the thing is, the idea that the, even the president has control of the agencies may be something of an illusion. Uh, the degree to which agencies are independent um, has grown significantly. Now, you, you sort of look at the exponential growth if you start from the founding to the present day. In 1790, uh, the federal government was composed of 1,000 non-military uh, employees, 1,000. By 1962, it was just short of 3 million. Okay. Now, though the numbers themselves can be misleading because part of the, quote, downsizing that we have seen in recent years have brought the numbers of the federal government down, but only by shifting tasks over to contractors. Uh, people like Mr. Snowden, people were shocked that you have a contractor that makes 200 grand. Uh, uh, for a contract that's not necessarily unique, but it does reflect that there's this huge workforce out there that is fairly non-transparent, uh, and the number, the size of the federal government is in fact larger uh, than it seems. But the size of the government itself is not the concern, it's not a particular concern in terms of the separation of powers, it's rather the authority of the agencies that is the concern. Now, when you consider how much the fourth branch does in comparison to the other two branches, you'll get a good idea. For example, in 2007, Congress enacted 138 public laws. That was a pretty good year in terms if you're looking for actual baseball counts. Uh, that was a highly productive year. That same year, the federal agencies produced just short of 3,000 regulatory rules and 61 major regulations. The fact is that the fourth branch has a far greater impact on the lives of citizens than all the other three branches put together. And what's troubling is the degree to which those branches have become insulated and independent even from Congress. Congress has this very small staff. The chances that they can review all but the smallest, almost insignificant percentage of agency actions uh, is, uh, is obvious. It is, it is, it, the Congress does not have a serious ability uh, to monitor the fourth branch. And indeed, the, the White House doesn't even monitor the fourth branch, nor could it. It has the same staff problems. So what Congress is left with, and what courts often talk about, in my view, wrongly, is that the power of the purse is the ultimate control over agencies. But that itself is rather silly. It's like running a locomotive with an on-off switch. Uh, it doesn't give you much of an ability to influence it, and, and you're not going to flip it off. You're not going to turn off the EPA. You're not going to turn off the Department of Transportation. And so the ability of Congress to influence all but a small percentage of agency policies um, is, is obviously quite small. Now, recently, it got, in my view, worse. And as David talked about with, with Justice Scalia, he has largely been someone who's been raising uh, the concerns over this. But he was not on the right side, in my view, uh, in a recent decision of Arlington versus FCC. And in Arlington versus FCC, we were dealing with what was an incredibly important question. Since 1984, when the, when the Supreme Court handed down Chevron, we've been giving this deference, Chevron deference, to agency decision makings. That deference is enormous. It is usually outcome determinative. Any of, uh, many of you have litigated these cases. To go up against an agency on a discretionary choice is the chances of your succeeding are very, very small. So Chevron discretion has expanded and expanded to the point that agencies are heavily insulated from review, certainly from a change. So up comes Arlington, where an agency said, not only do we get deference in interpreting our laws, we get deference in determining what our jurisdiction is. So when we say we have jurisdiction in that area, you've got to give us the same Chevron deference because we're the experts in this field. Now, the idea of jurisdiction has long been viewed as in the hands of people like Senator Cruz and other members of Congress, because that would be, that's one of the critical things. If, when you look at that on-off switch, the one thing Congress can do is at least lay the track, right? Congress at least can say, you're not gonna have a track going in this area, or you are, but it's up to them to lay the track. So I was astonished, quite frankly, when the court voted 5-4 in Arlington versus FCC 
that in fact agencies would be given deference in determining their jurisdiction. And Chief Justice Roberts, I thought, wrote a particularly interesting dissent. And Roberts said, it would be a, a bit much to describe the result in this case as, quote, the very definition of tyranny. I could question that. Uh, but he says, but the danger posed by the growing power of the administrative state cannot be dismissed. And I think that what, what Chief Justice Roberts was indicating is that we now have agencies that get deference both in where they can go in their jurisdictions and then how they interpret uh, their power. Now, that's, you can see the comparison between Congress and agencies. Take a look at the comparison between courts and agencies. You are 10 times more likely to be tried by an agency than a federal court. So, I'll give you an example. Um, in any given year, federal courts handle about 95,000 cases. Many of these are small cases, a lot of dismissals. This, in, in, in the same year, agencies handled 939,000 adjudicatory uh, hearings, just short of a million. Once you get pulled into that vortex, you find out that you have a small slither of the rights that you have in federal court. You're up against deference, as we talked about before. You often find very dismissive uh, proceedings. Many of us have been in these things. You're up against judges who rely largely for their continuation uh, the approval of the agency. It's not required, but we all know that if the agency really doesn't like an administrative law judge, it can generally get the judge canned. And so you have a system that's heavily weighted in favor of the agency. If you don't believe me, ask John Brennan. You know, John Brennan was a guy who went into an airport and decided to protest the TSA, and so he stripped. Okay, uh, this has come a very common form of, 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 of protest. Um, I, I, um, some of us spare others, uh, but, um, but, but John Brennan decided that he would strip because of the, the intrusive nature of the TSA. And so, the T, so he was charged criminally, goes to court, and the judge says, you know what? He actually didn't commit a crime here, at least not the one you're suggesting. He was engaged in free speech. And so I'm not going to let this case go forward. Okay. Brennan thought, okay, well, I won, prevailed. He walked out, and TSA told him, I, you're now going to be pulled into our agency for a charge. And so they just charged him, and he found himself in this one-sided process. And so we have agencies that are now functioning almost as a government onto themselves, and Congress struggling to find ways to control the fourth branch. That's what makes, and I'll just end with this, what makes the recess appointment fights over people like Cordray so fascinating is that you see Congress using nominations to try to, f to influence policy and to get answers. And that's the reason I don't think you can dismiss the Cordray issues uh, as uh, simply politics gone bad. In my view, it reflects something much more fundamental, which is the legislative branch trying to stay relevant uh, in a system that now has four branches. And so I will simply end with, the, with Federalist number 51, when it said, uh, when Madison said, the greatest difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and then in the next phase oblige it to control itself. What we have today is a fourth branch that really runs on its own controls and its own design. And that is something that I do think threatens liberty. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is very good to be with everyone. Uh, you know, I very much enjoyed Professor Turley's story about John Brennan stripping naked to protest the TSA. And you know, it's pretty incredible that he's now head of the CIA. <laughs> what a land of opportunity. Uh, and, and I have to admit, that civil libertarian streak gives, gives me some hope going forward. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, unfortunately, having, having come from Capitol Hill, I'm, I'm obliged to start by, by letting everyone know that, that by virtue of, of your being here, uh, tomorrow morning each of you is going to be audited by the IRS. Uh, but, but I appreciate the courage and your nonetheless uh, 
associating yourself w w with a group that, that if it hasn't been targeted uh, as, as almost a rogue group of dissidents, uh, it, 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 it perhaps should. So it is great to be with the launch of this project. This project is important. Uh, all of us in this room know the expansion we have seen on the executive side, on the regulatory side, on the administrative side. Uh, and that expansion is, is one of the most significant and troubling developments of modern times. At the end of the day, this question about executive overreach, about regulatory overreach, about the power of Article II is about two things. It's about power and it's about accountability. Have we seen the explosion of power on the administrative side? We've seen a corresponding diminishment of accountability, diminishment of being subject actually to the views of the citizenry. All of us saw, as David talked about, Lois Lerner go before Congress and say, I have done nothing wrong whatsoever, and I plead the fifth, which I would note if there are any criminal defense lawyers, George, I'm pretty sure that's not how you're supposed to plead the fifth. I, think that's right. uh, I also wouldn't advise that as a strategy if any of you are audited by the IRS. What we have seen and what we continue to see is more and more decisions being made, not on Capitol Hill, not on individuals who are accountable to the people elected by the people, but by unelected members of the regulatory state and more and more by those who don't even claim to be under Article II. They don't even claim to be accountable to the president. With independent agencies, you see those who claim to be truly unaccountable. You know, in the past 20 years, 81,883 final rules have been issued. That's more than 3,500 per year. That's nine final rules per day, which if we assume an eight-hour work week, or an eight-hour work day, although with federal government, work week might be more accurate, <laughs> that comes out to just more than one final rule per hour which means during this one hour program, on average, one final rule will have come out. Now, this is a room of very smart lawyers. Does anyone have any idea of the final rule we're getting this hour? And that's part of the problem. When you have this vast Byzantine mess, it becomes impossible to even to know what the thicket is. Just with Obamacare, we've got over 20,000 pages in regulations. It now stands over seven feet tall. In the Senate, we've got it on a giant red dolly. I'm pretty sure it's a violation of OSHA to have anything that tall in an office. But it becomes impossible to assess what's in it. You know, I did a teletown hall with about 50,000 Texans several weeks ago, and a small business owner asked me, said, how do I comply? What do I need to do? And, and I confess, I felt utterly powerless to, to tell her. The answer, how you comply with 20,000 pages of regulations when every six months an additional 3,000 pages of Obamacare regulations are being written. How on earth is the average citizen supposed to even know what's in there? Much the le less figure out how to comply. Last year, in 2012, Congress passed 127 new laws. I'm reminded of a cynical friend of mine who observed the First Amendment should have ended after the fifth word. Congress shall make no law. <laughs> that might have been a good thing. But 127 new laws pales in comparison to the 3,708 new rules that came out in the same year. That's a new rule every two and a half hours. 2012, the Federal Register had 78,961 pages. That's in one year. How on earth is the average citizen supposed to have any idea what is in 78,961 pages until the friendly neighborhood government official comes a knocking? CRS in May last month 
estimated, or calculated rather, that the Obama administration in its first term issued 330 major rules, rules that each of which had an economic impact of $100 million or more. And we wonder why economic growth is staggering, why it is sputtering along. You know, the last four years, our economy has grown 0.9% a year. When you have 330 major rules, each having the aggregate impact of 100 million or more, it is unsurprising that growth is stifled. And indeed, the cost of compliance, just tax compliance, is estimated to exceed 500 billion each year. That's roughly what we spend on our entire Defense Department. That's wasted each and every single year just dealing with IRS rules, regulations, compliance, lawyers, accountants. And the impact, as Jonathan talked about, on the average family is $14,678 per family, per year, nearly 15 grand. On businesses, because if you want to look at job creation, you look at businesses, per employee regulatory costs, it's estimated at 7,755 per employee for big companies, 500 employees or more. Now, here, here's a very interesting aspect. For small companies, for those with fewer than 20 employees, the per employee regulatory costs are estimated at $10,585 per employee. And I'll note, that's not an accidental feature, that it hits the little guys harder than it hits the big guys. That is indeed an intended effect of this explosion of regulation, because what it does is it puts a differential impact on small businesses, on entrepreneurs, on those starting up, which has the benefit of entrenching the established players. And that is a consistent aspect, an unfortunate aspect, of modern-day politics that we see. We see it, we see it in, in legislation. You look at something like Dodd-Frank, which was ostensibly passed to prevent too big to fail. What has it done? It's made the big banks bigger, and it's hammered small banks and community banks. And that was precisely the objective in passing it. Unfortunately, that goes exactly the opposite direction if we want economic growth. You know, the most important thing in our economy for economic growth is what Schumpeter called creative destruction. It is not the gigantic corporation, it's the crazy entrepreneur starting a company in his or her garage that's going to topple that corporation. That's where the dynamism in our economy has come from. And when you're putting nearly $11,000 per employee in regulatory burden on brand new startups, that has a predictable impact of killing innovation, killing entrepreneurship, and killing jobs. And the Obama administration continues asking for more and more regulatory power in court. You know, in April, I released from my Senate offices in, uh, under the auspices of, uh, I'm the ranking member on the Constitution Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee, and so we released a report focusing on executive overreach and in particular focusing on arguments that the Obama Justice Department has made in front of the U.S. Supreme Court for expanded federal power that have been rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously. And as the report detailed in the previous 18 months, there were six different instances of the Obama Justice Department going before the court asking for broad power and having every justice on the court, both the conservatives and the liberals, unanimously rejected, whether it was in Sackett versus EPA that David re referenced where they argued the Obama Justice Department for the power to deprive law landowners of the right to challenge potential government fines as high as $75,000 a day and to take away their ability to have a hearing. The Supreme Court unanimously rejected that. They argued in Gabelli versus SEC to dramatically extend the statute of limitations to impose penalties for acts committed decades ago. 
They argued in Arkansas Fish and Game Commission versus United States to allow the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to destroy private property without paying just compensation. Unanimously rejected. In Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC, they argued for the ability to control and interfere with the selection of a church's ministers. And in fact, there was an exchange that I want to highlight in closing between Justice Kagan and the Department of Justice, where Justice Kagan asked, quote, do you believe that a church has a right that is grounded in the free exercise and or the establishment clause? to institutional autonomy with respect to its employees. The answer from the U.S. Solicitor General's office was, we don't see that line of church autonomy principles in the religious clause, ju in the religious clause jurisprudence as such. And the answer from Justice Kagan, who I know would note was appointed by President Obama, was President Obama's Solicitor General, he is rarely confused with Antonin Scalia, Justice Kagan from the bench said, it is amazing, that was her word, amazing, that the Department of Justice believed, quote, that neither the free exercise clause nor the establishment clause has anything to say about a church's relationship with its own employees. It is amazing, but it is unfortunately the state of affairs when you have a government whose power is expanding and expanding and expanding at the expense of liberty. And I will say finally, with apologies to the good Professor Turley, that our constitutional structure was designed, as his friend Thomas Jefferson put it, <laughs> our Constitution was to serve as chains to bind the mischief of government. And I salute all of you for being here to study the strength and durability of those chains. Thank you. Thank you. We're off to a we're off to a great start. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. There are microphones on either side. We're recording this, so you need to pose your questions from the microphones. Uh, we'll alternate between them uh, until we exhaust our time. Let's go here first. Yes. Um, this is a question for anybody on the panel who wants to uh, comment. My name is Roman Bueller from the Madison Coalition. And uh, most of you are probably aware of the uh, RAINS Act that Republicans in the House passed to require that Congress approve major new federal regulations. But the chances of it getting uh, enacted and signed by the President seem low. And I wonder what you would think of a uh, constitutional approach which would constitutionally require uh, for example, that when uh, some percentage of the House or Senate uh, objected to a proposed federal regulation, uh, that it would then require a majority of both the House and the Senate to approve that regulation. Who wants to respond first? Well, um, let, me, let me just talk a little bit about the RAINS Act. The <laughs> it, it, I am strongly in favor of it. When I was in Congress, we passed the predecessor, the um, Congressional Review Act. Essentially, what Reins would do is flip the presumption that for major rules, the agencies can't go forward without a positive vote in Congress. Um, I, I think it's a, a necessary, or a step towards a necessary realignment of um, the improper delegation of authority from Congress to the agencies to effectively write laws. Um, there are probably other ways to do it. A constitutional amendment could address that. Um, my skepticism about constitutional amendments generally is the difficulty of getting them passed. Um, why not apply the principles that I think are inherent there in, as um, Professor Turley mentioned, the separation of powers that Madison constructed um, and have all three branches reassess that inappropriate delegation of authority to the agencies. Senator Cruz, Professor Turley, anything on this point? I, you know, I, I agree with David on that. I, I think the RAINS Act is, is a terrific idea. I strongly support it. Um, you know, I would be supportive of a constitutional amendment that did something similar, but the challenge of the RAINS Act is we don't have the vote to, votes to pass it down, which means we definitely don't have the votes to pass a constitutional amendment. Uh, and 
the effort to limit the power of the regulatory state is, I think, an ongoing argument that we need to win. I think the predicate to passing the RAINS Act is, is winning the argument with the American people, connecting the costs and burdens of these regulations to the economic challenges we have. And, and, and actually, that's something which, which the men and women in this room can play an integral part. One of the astonishing things about Obamacare uh, that, that I think has really startled the administration is the degree to which the American people are understanding cause and effect. They're understanding that the impact of Obamacare on health care, on the economy, is really quite harmful. And they're blaming it correctly on that bill. I think the administration cynically believed that all the bad consequences would just be blamed on the evil health insurance companies and, and that the bill would just be seen as having brought all the good stuff. Uh, that's not happening, which is why Obamacare is dropping almost daily in popularity as it's getting implemented because it's driving up premiums, it's, it's hammering employees, but what we need to do to pass something like the RAINS Act is make the broader case to the American people and not just in a room full of conservative and libertarian lawyers, but we need to make the case in VFW halls. We need to make the case at PTA meetings that the impact of these regulations are harming our economy and harming jobs. That's how we change the dynamic and get the RAINS Act passed, but I think it's a very important step. Professor Trulli, anything on this point? Oh, I couldn't add anything. I agree. All right. Yes, sir. I'm Michael Doherty from Atlanta. I'm the president CEO of LabMD, and I'm one of the few members that's not a lawyer, I think, and I appreciate being here and, and enjoy uh, how much I learned from you all. You'll um, probably be buried in business cards, but go ahead. Huh? What? You'll probably be buried no, in no, business no, cards. No, 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 no. They all have them. <laughs> Um, I, I'm actually under investigation by the Federal Trade Commission right now. And one of the reasons I join all these things and is, is, is I, I want to, I'm sort of the conduit of the real world and not the theory. And I think for every one of me, there's probably 40 that have not gotten to this place or just rolled over because they can. And what I see is uh, by what you speak of, and, and Mr. McIntosh, you were just singing to the choir there, uh, is is how they, and I'm actually writing a book about this, and that is probably what my card's about, but part of my book is the transpa being transparent about what they do behind that the, the wizard's curtain, and it is, they don't want me to go to court. They're dragging me through the mud. They circle and confuse. It is, and it's not what they say, it's what they do. And I, I, that is exactly what I want to bring to people's attention outside of the Beltway. To, so that, because once people get it in the VFW halls, they will understand that this is not in our self-interest and Congress will be able to act. But I have seen this judiciary uh, uh, com compliance with this and this just enabling uh, the agencies. And it's, it's shocking. Um, and I don't know how you speak to how we handle what happens before we get to court? Because that mountain to get to court, for someone like me, I'm fortunate. I mean, I don't have any debt. I am a cancer detection center. They have no shame who they go after. And I've spent about half a million dollars so far to get to that quote unquote level playing field of the judiciary, and most people can't make it up that mountain. What do we do about all those people? Uh, and there's no quick answer. Yeah, <laughs> no, there isn't. Um, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it's when I was there with my regulatory relief subcommittee, I focused a lot on what are the new rules coming out so we can avoid the cost. When we listened to Americans and we had field hearings all over the country, 90% of the witness talked about the enforcement and the unfairness in the enforcement proceedings that they had to live through. Um, Senator Cruz mentioned we need to take this message beyond just the, the core believers in the Federalist Society or, or liberty, um, which we all share. And I, I've been intrigued recently listening to young people and their desire for justice. And I think we need to describe your story, I'm glad you're writing a book, and share with them this is not a just state when it treats its citizens this way. I really, I am not a victim. I'm probably one of the few lucky ones that have the backbone and the finances to be a conduit. And my editor's job is constantly to smack my self-interest out of the book and tell the story because the facts of their behavior stand on their own and it is chilling. 
Well, and, and I think that's very powerful, telling stories. Uh, it, it's something we need to do. Stories communicate in a way that abstract facts and figures do not. Uh, and, you know, one clear example, everyone here remembers the $800 hammer? That was 30 years ago. That was an example that was invoked 30 years ago, and we still remember it. Uh, you know, in terms of telling stories, I mean, one group that tells stories fantastically is the Institute for Justice. IJ does a tremendous job of telling stories of individual entrepreneurs, people who are working towards the American dream and being persecuted by asinine rules and regulations and legislation that more often than not is designed by their larger competitors in bed with, with those in government to try to stop the up, upstart competition. And I think telling those stories, we think of the Kelo case which Kelo ended up with a lousy result in the Supreme Court, but actually a very significant result in the court of public opinion as people understood that woman whose house was being taken, so a pharmaceutical company, and taken by force by the government to be given to a pharmaceutical company to build their parking lot. Um, stories have force and impact, and, and so that's, that's one thing I think we should do a lot more of. Let's go to this side, take another question. Uh, Gene Meyer, um, wanted to ask Professor Turley, uh, from the point of view of those who are inclined to uh, want a larger role for government uh, than ma ma most of those in this room, is there, do you have any thoughts on how to reach some of those people in terms of the dangers of the, of, of, uh, some of, of some of the regu of some of the regulations that, you know, they might in principle support, but they might also be aware that, you know, this is going, perhaps goes too far in many cases. Well, I think that you're not going to find a partisan divide uh, on some of these questions. I think that some of the issues we talked about today resonates with people who, rather, regardless of whether they're conservative or liberal, uh, for example. Uh, one of the greatest problems that we're facing in this fourth branch uh, is the role of adjudications and the lack of due process. Uh, most citizens, if you explain to them how little right you have to things like attorneys, to, a, to how you come up against presumptions and deferences that you can't overcome, um, I think that will resonate with people. Uh, and what I think is troubling about some of the stories that we, we heard is that even when you get to federal court, the damage has already been done. Uh, many of us, myself included, have taken uh, cases through uh, the agency process to federal court. And you face this heavily weighted system in an administrative proceeding where every presumption goes with the agency. You're not entitled to full procedural protections. And then when you re finally get a final decision that you can take to court, it's largely locked in because of things like Chevron. And so you never really do get a level playing field where you can say, all right, now I have the opportunity to present everything uh, that uh, I want this court to hear. I think that those issues will resonate with folks. But we also have to be even-handed. That is, we have to say it's not just some agencies, it's all agencies. That uh, you can't exclude agencies. You have to afford citizens' rights across the board. And I think that we can do that. But I think part of it is the education, of, as we talked about, of, of, of the public. The Kelo decision, in my view, is one of the worst and, frankly, most moronic decisions I have seen come out of the Supreme Court in my lifetime. And, and that's I, saying something. Yeah. And I have a very hard time teaching it in class. Uh, and I have never taught a class where I've taught Kelo where I had anyone that could come up with a defense of that decision. It's, it's, it still takes my breath away that the court ruled on that. But it also shows that it's not just dealing with regulations, things like the RAINS Act. We also have to look at things like Kelo and how we've ch changed the meaning of the Constitution that have also expanded uh, the authority. In this case, it was the city that was doing it, but I never imagined the court would say that you could take property from one private citizen and give it to effectively another private citizen who you like more. 
I have to note, Jonathan, but how thoroughly we've infiltrated your mind is in your opening remarks, you cited first the Federalist Society papers and, th and then cited the Federalist Society 51. So. <laughs> it's the explosive molar, I think. I wish you would remove it. <laughs> yeah. Any comment on this point from you two gentlemen? Another question on this side? Hi, uh, David Wagner. This question is primarily for, for uh, Professor Turley, but for anyone else, I'd like to hear anyone else's comments. Uh, about uh, the um, Arlington v. FCC case, uh, as you know, the, the major point in the, for, for the majority was that when you try to distinguish between issues that are jurisdictional, uh, when it, an agency is looking at it, uh, a decision it has to make, and, and, and issues that are not, that are sub-jurisdictional, your hand, it's not as easy as it sounds. Your hands close on nothing, uh, unless, of course, you're an administrative lawyer, in which case your hands close on lots and lots of fees because you're charging your clients to litigate that issue. Uh, to take Chevron itself, uh, you could say that it's about whether a stationary source of pollution does or does not mean three chimneys or one, uh, or you could say that it's about whether EPA has jurisdiction over that issue and make it a jurisdictional issue. And I was wondering what your reaction to that was and anyone else's. Well, thank you very much for the question. Actually, this goes to one of the uh, Law Review articles that I um, have coming out, which, which is arguing for a separation of powers approach to uh, interpretations on these types of issues. Uh, the argument is, is, is parallel to what, how we deal with federalism. That is, in federalism, you had a system that has changed fundamentally because the federal government um, has a, a range of powers and independence the framers didn't anticipate, including federal taxation, uh, the removal of the election of senators by state legislatures. These were things that really tied Congress to the states in a meaningful way. And the question in federalism, and I'll come back to your question, is what's the role of the Supreme Court in light of those changes? I happen to believe that the court needs to fill the gap because the Constitution still is committed to a federalism system. And that means that in their interpretations, they need to to reinforce federalism principles, um, perhaps more aggressively than they had to at the beginning of the republic. The same is true with the fourth estate pro uh, the fourth uh, branch problem. That is, with the reason I didn't like Arlington versus FCC is that there was a principal example where the court could have drawn a line. Uh, it is a, 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 not the best case in my view for this because when you read the case, you're sort of like, wow, this really does come close to the line. But in my view, the court should have created a bright line on jurisdiction and said, we're going to have to work out how to define this. But this is an example where the court could have rebalanced the system slightly by saying, I'm leaving it. We need to leave it to Congress to establish where the tracks are laid, uh, even if we accept once you're on the track that you get some deference as to speed and where you stop. Final thought, gentlemen? Senator? Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. We're off to a good start, I think. Uh, we have uh, a number of breakout sessions now. You need to be careful about which room you're in. In this room, we'll be discussing the innovation and technology sector. Uh, to my left, we'll be talking about labor and employment law next. And to my right, over criminalization at the federal level. So enjoy your day.